but let me introduce Brad. Um, so I've known Brad for just a couple of years. And the first year uh, when we were both fellows at the Berkman Center, um, Brad was also in the OGC, the Office of General Counsel, which means he was a lawyer for Harvard. Not just at Harvard, but for Harvard. Um, and then we stayed in, in, in touch um, because we like each other, but also because Brad was working on a really important project, which was um, the release, the making openly available of the metadata about Harvard's library collection, 12.3 million volumes. It's hugely important that this catalog bibliographic information got out, but it's also required a very particular type of lawyer to do it because it is a rat's nest trying to, was a rat's nest trying to get this um, data um, made available. There's tons of licenses and, um, and uh, IP issues. Requires a lawyer who is both committed to openness and is committed to social good beyond questions of, of risk. And Brad was fantastic in pushing this forward. And um, our culture actually owes Brad and other people who are working on this, of course, a, a debt of gratitude. So uh, I've always been really uh, happy that you did that. I was an admirer of that. So when Brad sent out a notice saying that he had uh, written and, and, and published a novel. I got a sinking feeling, nothing personal, saying, thinking, oh my god, here's a friend who's written, I didn't know he wrote fiction, and the chances that it's good fiction? Forget Brad, just in general, the probabilities are that it's terrible fiction. And so I'm thinking, oh god, I'm going to have to come up with some innocuous ways of saying, acknowledging that I read it and finding something good about it. You know, I, I, I really liked your use of cliche, Brad. Or I, I was, I found the predictability of the plot to be really comforting. You know, like, and I started reading it. I, I, I love this book. This, I think Brad is a brilliant, brilliant writer. I, the book is hilarious. It's uh, unpredictable. It works at, at multiple levels. It, 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 it its plot works. Um, thematically and as a narrative, it's, it's the, um, each character, and they're all a little bit over the top, is that okay to say? Yeah, yeah. Okay. intended to be. Yeah. Oh good, thank <laughs> God. They're all a little bit over the top, they all have backstories that Brad tells us, and each of those backstories could be the beginning of another novel, they're all, it's a wonderful, inventive book that creates its own world with its own logic that turns out to be tied in important, in important ways to our own world, and it progresses as you, as you discover the logic that Brad somehow has invented. It's a wonderful book. So, Brad, tell us about the process. Sure. Thanks. Um, uh, I would walk into crowded rooms and confront people much more often if I had um, David alongside me. Um, the lawyer in me won't let me start without um, a disclaimer, and the disclaimer is that I am very emphatically not a success story in this area. So if you were hoping that um, I could give you tips on how to, to, to make millions or thousands um, or even hundreds of dollars selling a book <laughs> on Amazon, uh, you'd be out of luck. Um, as best I can figure, the way that you do it is that you write books about how to sell books on Kindle. Um, and here are just several. And, and you write about, or you write about vampires, or some combination of the two. Um, I haven't done either of those things. And so um, what I thought I would do today is instead offer you some of my 11-year-old um, thoughts on a history and trajectory of authorship and publishing. Um, and then from there, sort of draw on my own personal experiences as a writer um, to test, inform, undercut as applicable um, uh, that 11-year-old theory. So. Um, so theory first, um, I, uh, and hopefully this won't be, be too oppressive, but um, as a third year law student in 2001, I wrote a note for the, the Harvard Law Review. And I was a law student because I hadn't managed to sell any fiction. Um, and I was a law student because um, my other idea was to be a uh, professor of 18th century British literature, and my prospects for that were pretty bleak too. So, um, so here I was in law school, um, a bit frustrated on those two scores, but nonetheless, I was able to sort of make use of my aggravations as a writer um, and my interest in history and literature to write this note, which I rather polemically titled, I was in my 20s, so give me a break, um, Exploitative Publishers, Untrustworthy Systems in the Dream of a Digital Revolution for Artists. 
And then I put the Smith's quote underneath. So, um, so yeah, I was on fire when I wrote that. Um, the notes uh, object, at least in part, is to offer a three-phase trajectory of produ literary production and authorship um, that is based on sort of the Marxist uh, historical theory and, um, and hinges around the two sort of significant disruptive developments in literary production, namely and obviously the printing press, movable type, and digital media and the internet. And so um, the first phase, I, as I would describe it, is sort of a pre-modern feudal phase of literary production that dates um, from antiquity to probably roughly the middle of the 18th century when um, industrialized publishing really started to get some legs under it. Um, and during this era, I, which I, I, I call it sort of a feudal condition because, um, I guess there's a pun there, feudal and futile probably for writers, um, because aristocratic patrons um, dominated literary culture. Um, they were, of course, the, the folks in society with, um, with money and clout, um, and uh, authors weren't really in a position to bring their works to market directly to readers, and there wasn't really a community of readers quite like there is today. Um, and so writers depended upon their patrons for, um, for their living and for career advancement. And what the patron was able to offer was a stipend, perhaps, a, a living wage, a patron might commission a work, um, a patron might simply uh, use uh, his or her clout among the literati to bring interest and favor to a writer's works. Um, and in return, um, the writer was expected then to, to, to give something back. Um, and uh, I'm oversimplifying things for sure. This was, a, this was 1,200, 15, no, more than that, 1,700 years um, that I'm covering. But uh, two ways in which you could give something back to your patron. Um, would be to uh, make an offering in the content of your work. That is, you could write a poem that would celebrate um, the valor, the good taste, the military victory of, of uh, your patron. Um, you could mount an attack on your patron's political rivals, as, as Alexander Pope was particularly skilled at doing. Um, you could do what uh, Virgil did, which was write an epic poem that um, did the work of establishing the lineage of Emperor Augustus all the way back to the Olympian gods. Um, Another way that you could um, win and hold the favor of your patron would be to offer the work itself um, as the deliverable in a, in a dedication. Um, and this is something that um, we see a lot now, and we don't take it to mean what it meant back in those days, which was actually really um, a dedication. Here's one that I particularly like by one of my fa favorite authors, Lawrence Stern. This is a dedication to Tristram Shandy. Um, uh, the author would write the dedication with great sort of uh, flattering words of presentment, lay the work at the feet of the patron and say, this is yours, I did this for you. Um, and so in this sense, patrons really sort of owned and controlled literature. Um, and as you can imagine, authors weren't particularly thrilled about this over time. Um, a condition of dependence always breeds resentments. Um, and authors certainly felt that they were, they were the ones that were actually producing works, um, only to have the patrons sort of carry the applause and raise their hands and celebrate themselves at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Um, they may have felt compromised in the content of their work too, and surely at times they also felt neglected by their patrons. Um, and so I'd, what I'd like to do now is read a quote to you from Samuel Johnson, who uh, was uh, responding to Lord Chesterfield, who um, at the 11th hour, without having given any substantial assistance to Johnson in his efforts, um, wanted to take hold of the dedication for Johnson's Dictionary. Um, and Johnson wrote to him, Seven years, my lord, have now passed since I waited in your outward rooms or was repulsed from your door, during which time I have been pushing on my work through difficulties of which it is useless to complain, and have brought it at last to the verge of publication without one act of assistance, one word of encouragement, or one smile of favor. Such treatment I did not expect, for I never had a patron before. Is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in the water, and when he has reached ground, encumbers him with help? Um, <laughs> it's a great line. Um, so Johnson could be this frank and confrontational with his patrons because he lived on the cusp of what I would call phase two, which is the era of industrialized publishing. Um, and of course, this, was, uh, this industrialization of publishing was accomplished by the introduction of the printing press, and it took some time for an industry to organize. Um, but the press alter, ultimately delivered um, what I would call paraphrasing Marx, the means of reproduction, um, into the hands of, of entrepreneurs. Um, and this, uh, this fact brought uh, 
it delivered authors from uh, the dependency and control of their patrons, which is terrific, but it delivered them into the dependency and control, I would argue, of the publishers. Um, and why is that? Um, <coughs> simply because, and, and this I think is, is, uh, is part of the human condition, it's something that um, I, I don't think is ever going to change, is that there, there was simply a superabundance of literary manuscripts on offer for entry into the market. Um, uh, there will never, I don't think, ever be a shortage of writers who are desperate to communicate their ideas, their stories, their poems and prose to the broader community. Um, and so uh, um, given this, this superabundance of manuscripts, um, you, you, you see actually that the bottleneck in literary production um, happens not at the point of composition, but at the point of publication. And so as a result, um, printers um, acquired sort of incidentally to owning the means of reproduction um, the power of selecting what works would make it to market um, and in that sense came to take hold of the literary culture in the way that we we understand now is, is sort of it's it's just how, how the world is um, <coughs> so publishers uh, uh, get to decide what works get lifted out of the slush pile which is their word for um, the big corpus of works that we all work very hard on um, for many days and many months. Um, and uh, they lift works out of the slush pile and they dust them off and look them over and they decide whether they're appropriate to be copied and put on, on carts to the London bookseller or on trucks to the Barnes and Noble today. Um, <coughs> and these days we, we see a, a, a measure of sophistication and professionalism in this process. Um, publishing companies have sort of grafted onto their production apparatus um, divisions of folks who select and edit works for publication. And these folks may be very uh, great at what they do, and they may discharge this, this duty, this service to the literary culture with, with the highest motives. Um, <coughs> but the problem is that we didn't choose these people to be the gatekeepers to decide what subset of works we get to read. Um, and they may care greatly for the literary culture, but ultimately their accountability is, of course, to shareholders. Um, does this condition work for writers? Um, it's certainly better than the old feudal state of things. Um, certainly the cr criteria for success isn't that you've written something that is particularly appealing to the whims or biases of Lord so-and-so or Lady such-and-such. -such. Um, <coughs> rather, the criterion now is what, what will an editor think is going to sell? Um, we see people able to make livings as writers and actually succeed um, and, and become very successful. Um, but there still is a superabundance problem. Um, and, uh, and of course, I speak from the perspective of someone who has not been selected um, to participate in, uh, in, in, the, in the market of, of traditionally published works. Um, so the superabundance problem persists and, and, and is probably um, aggravated by the fact that more folks think that they can can uh, make some headway here and actually sort of uh, get, make a living as a writer. Um, and we actually see in the, in the context of fiction, where I work, um, there are two barriers to entry now that you have to clear. Um, because a um, no self-respecting editor at a, at a publishing house is going to review your work unless it arrives um, uh, in hand from a literary agent. So now you have to get a literary agent to favor you and then take your cause to um, to the publisher. And I really, really wish David Weinberger were a literary agent. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to untuck my shirt because I'm getting kind of hot up here. Um, so um, you could argue that for readers, certainly we have more works on the market. Um, this isn't working. OK. Um, <laughs> We have more works on the market, um, but the odds of making a living as a writer are very long, and I, and I would suggest that if you, if you want to be a writer, you're, you're probably better off just writing for yourself and buying scratch tickets, um, because it's not as frustrating um, when your scratch ticket tells you you've lost. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, so here I am now complaining about the state of things. Um, I've complained about the feudal state of things. I'm complaining now about the modern state of things. I've done a lot of complaining. Is there any hope for writers? Is there hope for someone like me? Um, can I believe that my works, which haven't been selected, are any good? And if I do believe they're good, what can I do about it? Um, well, there is something I can do about it. Um, and as I wrote 11 years ago, digital media and the internet deliver that promise. Um, digital media and the internet um, invest all of us with the means of reproduction, of course. Any, any of us can, uh, can, once we've composed a work, 
can very easily copy it hundreds of thousands of times over um, and send them off like a shot to the four corners of the world at negligible cost. Um, we can make our works directly available to readers. So terrific, it's over. We don't need publishers anymore. Um, <coughs> so I feel a not so fast coming, um, and I feel it largely because it's in my notes. Um, <laughs> The, the not so fast problem is, is again that we have this problem of a superabundance of manuscripts. Um, readers, um, and, and I'm one of them, uh, have come to rely on publishers to do the work of uh, winnowing away at the superabundance of manuscripts that we may or may not want to read um, into sort of a lesser abundance of works that we probably might like to read. Um, and we're comfortable, we have grown comfortable with them doing that work for us. Um, so. What we do when we cut publishers out of the equation, and anyone can bring their works to market, is we move the slush pile um, around the ankles of the readers. Um, and how are they going to find, um, how are they going to figure out what they want without, and, and there's a little bit, you can, you can sense a little bit of sarcasm here, without publishers making that decision for them. Um, and so what I would propose is um, the readers can decide for themselves. Um, the, uh, that we can create a, a ground level, reader based, um, committed critical culture where readers can read books, um, review them, and of course, using the means of reproduction themselves, publish those reviews as, as, as David has on his blog. Um, and uh, based on, and, and they can accrue authority based on, on the, um, their success in recommending books. Well, boy, the things that David writes, reads, I, I, I tend to like a lot too. I think I'm going to read them. Amazon does this, of course, um, uh, a little bit with, with their people who bought this book also bought. Um, but we can actually be more substantive than that. We can, you don't have to work for the New York Times book review to tell people what you think about, about a work. So, hooray. Um, everybody has the, the means of reproduction. Um, it's like Oprah, you get the means of reproduction. You get the means, everybody gets it. Um, <clears throat> so why then did it take me 11 years to self-publish my own book? Um, I talked the talk in 2001 about how, you know, we can sort of kickstart um, a, a world in which um, publishers don't uh, predetermine our, our literature, our literary culture. Um, <clears throat> and the truth is that, um, I mean, I've got all sorts of excuses I can offer. I've got small children, um, I've got a day job. But the truth is that um, traditional publishing still offered a better prospect for me um, than self-publishing. And um, for a number of reasons. First, that um, publishing in a digital format has not been uh, it does not presented an attractive prospect for readers. Um, that's, that's starting to change with the introduction of the Kindle, um, with handheld devices, um, uh, people are a little more interested in taking something digital to the beach instead of, of um, their, their dog-eared copy, dog copy of their favorite book. Um, so that's, that's some progress has been made since 2001, surely on that front. Um, but the truth is that um, publishers, when they select something for publication, they put it on the fast track. It gets favored status. Um, and I have been, I have felt very, 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 very close to getting there. Um, and I have convinced myself that if I just write a few more people, if I can just really get two people to like this book, the, the agent and the editor, then I'm there. I'm a better class of people than anyone else who's written a book. I'm Hertz number one club gold. I can go to the front um, of the line. Um, and for that matter, I would also have, of course, um, the marketing or promotional muscle and expertise um, that the publishers have um, put behind my work. And I certainly have, as you will see, very little marketing <laughs> and promotional muscle or expertise. Um, and so, uh, you know, I continued over 10 years um, uh, to try to sell my books. The first, the first not my first novel, had, I had three agents at various times. The last agent was very, very, very good at getting flattering and encouraging rejection letters from publishers for me. <laughs> um, the kind of letters that made me think, all right, that's a guy who liked me. I can go back with my other book to him and he'll definitely take me. Um, he'll definitely take the second one. You can convince yourself um, that, that the brass ring is within your reach. Um, and by contrast, I had thrown my books out on the internet in the meantime. 
um, and didn't get much of a reception for them. I don't know if any of you have heard of in defense of cactuskelly.com. Um, probably not. That was, <laughs> that was the website that hosted my first novel in the late 90s. Um, I blogged the second book. The second book is The, the Turnpike Witch. Um, <clears throat> I blogged that book, and I thought, well, this is an opportunity now. I can nest this work in multimedia. I can have aperture links. I can have audio and video pop up images that will enhance the reader experience. That would be fantastic. And I did all this, and nobody came. <laughs> I built my field of dreams, and nobody came. So, um, so given, these, given the hope that traditional publishing promised for me and, um, and, and the realities I was confronting with self-publishing, it just, it just didn't seem like something um, I was prepared to do. Um, but time passes, and um, self-publishing becomes a more promising prospect because, as I said, of the Kindle, but also because digital marketplaces emerge where people can more easily um, uh, find works that they want to read and market the works that they, um, that they want to sell. Um, and so Kindle Direct Publishing, Smashwords, iBooks, um, all offer ways for, for, for writers to, um, to, to make a bit of money selling their books. Um, it just seems more appealing. Um, so so self-publishing became a more attractive prospect. Um, the glimmers of hope um, in traditional publishing began to fade for me with this, this second book. Um, and I, at some point, you just kind of have to cut the cord. I have a, a, a long-standing, codependent, not very constructive relationship with my turnpike witch, and I felt that it was time at a certain point um, just to send her off. Um, and rather than edit and re-edit and resubmit and resubmit, um, I could put it out and work on something else. So I banged the book into shape. Um, I uh, uploaded it made my selections about royalty schemes and where I would make it available, and then I just pushed the button, and it's, it's up there. So now what? Um, how do I get readers? Um, again, we have the superabundance problem. Um, I don't know how many books are published on, um, uh, on Amazon. I don't know how many titles are there. They're, they're actually seem to be pretty cagey about telling us. Um, and, or either that or I'm just lousy at Google, but I... I tend to be actually not so bad at Google. But I can say, um, where is it on here? I can say that there are at least 164,296 titles out there <laughs> because that's my ranking on Amazon. <laughs> um, and I can also say that there's actually 340,000 because that's where I was a couple days ago. So it doesn't take much <laughs> to bump you up 180,000 notches on their rankings. Um, so. Uh, given that fact, now I have to figure out um, how to get people to be aware of, interested in reading my book. So the obvious idea was social media. We talk at Berkman about how awesome social media is, how paradigm changing it is. And if you can, if you can overthrow your Egyptian dictator um, through social media, then you might be able to get people to read my book. Um, they're probably comparably difficult projects. Um, <laughs> That said, I am, not, I am not gifted at Twitter and, and Facebook, um, and I'm not very much practiced as a Twitter or a tweeter, and I'm not even sure which is the proper usage there. Um, I can say things, certainly, on Twitter. I'm not as very good at selling them. So um, that said, there is a Twitter handle for the Turnpike Witch, and it has 12 followers. Um, uh, and onward and upward. Um, Facebook, I'm doing a little bit better. Facebook, uh, I've posted some ads. I've worked with a friend of mine who's, who's a pretty effective social media marketer, and I have some um, 421 likes. Um, but what I've learned is that likes on Facebook don't translate to sales and reading, sales and reading of your book. Um, it, it, it seems, um, or if they do, they, they translate at a, maybe a 1% rate. <laughs> um, so, um, so I, I, and I don't know that, that it's necessarily that social media isn't, isn't the fittest or most useful tool um, to promote a book um, as a, as a self-published writer. I know that, uh, that, it, it, that it's not working for me, but I would think that at least 50% of that is, is my own sort of ham-handedness and half-assedness. So um, I 
I'm not entirely sold on, how, on using social media um, to get where I want to be. Um, Amazon makes it possible for you to do free promotions. And this is, this is where things get, let me be a little more interesting. Um, I am now going to show you proprietary information under the condition that you tell nobody else and that you don't laugh at me. Um, this is, these are my sales for the last month. And I want to say this is my worst of the three months, by the way. Um, in the 28 days that the book has been available for a $3 charge, I've sold four copies. Um, I've had three of them borrowed using Kindle Select. Um, in the three days that I ran a promo, I had 350 downloads. So it gives you a sense of um, what people will pay for a self-published work. Um, one sort of interesting thing about how this works is that um, the promotions themselves sort of get you channeled into um, uh, Amazon's, uh, Amazon's promotions. So rather than sitting back and hoping that some, somehow, some way, people will find my Amazon sales page, um, uh, instead, when you, when, you, um, when you start to make your book available for free, um, there's the potential that if enough people are interested in it, you might find yourself listed on their sort of top, uh, top most popular free downloads. Um, and for a period of time last week, um, I probably should have done this this week so that I could show you the page. But for a period of time last week, um, I was in the top 20 among all sort of freely available um, literary fiction um, uh, titles on Amazon. And I was right up there with great expectations. I was up there with Dickens and Jane Austen and the Brontes and everybody else. <laughs> and right in the middle of the Turnpike Witch. Um, <clears throat> I felt good about that because there weren't as, as many other self-published, non-public domain works up there. Um, and as I understand it, and as best I can figure out, the reason why I got the number of free downloads that I did and the reason why I was where I was on the list um, is that I have um, uniformly good reviews. I have three of them, but they're all five-star reviews um, on my page. And so as my page appears with the review stars beside it, people go, okay, that one, people, people like that book. Um, and so I make it a little further up that, that chart um, than, than other folks will. Um, and so that gets me to starting to think about um, the review-based um, consumer culture that I, was, that I was describing in 2001 and, and I'm still hopeful about now. Um, of course, on Amazon, um, your Amazon reviews can't take you terribly far because you have to find the person's Amazon page to see them. Um, but there are people out in the broader community. There are book blogs. There are general interest blogs like David has where he might review a book. Um, <coughs> And those present the potential that people will, um, particularly on the book blogs, people are looking for books to read. Um, they're going to see a review, find that it's favorable, find that they might be interested in it, rely on um, the authority that the writer has accumulated over time in reviewing books, and make a decision to pull the trigger to pay the, the $3 um, to, buy, to buy your book, um, and maybe put five or 10 minutes into reading the first chapter and, and go from there. So I, you know, I, I don't want to go on for too much longer. I will say that, that even sort of the reviewing culture now suffers from, it's a little bit of a casualty of the superabundance problem that I've run into, uh, that, that authors run into to everywhere. Um, by and large, if you want to find a good book blogger to review your book, you've got to ask them. You've got to make a pitch to them. It's not unlike a query letter that you would make to an agent, and then they decide whether they're going to take it on or not. Um, <laughs> there are other sites that will um, absolutely do without you know, requiring anything from you. Do a review of your book for a mere $425, um, which um, is about eight times what I've brought in in royalties so far. So um, I don't see myself working with Kirkus Indy. Um, so you know, I stand here, as I said, I, I gave you the disclaimer. I stand here fairly clueless about where to go from here. Um, but I'm sort of hopeful in a general sense that um, uh, we're on the cusp of something great. We're on the cusp of, of, of creating a situation where um, publishers aren't the final answer on what, uh, what we're going to see and what people get to read. Um, and I think what needs to happen to, to sort of carry that promise forward is that um, readers need to believe that, that a book that's not traditionally published um, can still be a good book. Um, Readers need to um, look outside sort of the walled garden to see what might be out there. And this, is, I think, is a tough one because I, I think about my own choices as a reader. 
Um, I am perfectly content with what's available on bookshelves. I've got a backlog of books that, I, that I'm interested in reading that, um, <coughs> that come from traditional publishers. Why, why should I be a pioneer? Why should I go out and look for that new, hip new writer that no one's heard about, the indie writer? Um, so I think that's something that, that needs to be overcome. Um, readers, as I said, need to become critics and reviewers in their own right. Um, and last, writers, writers like me need to trust that readers will do these things. And if they do, um, I, I think digital media and the internet can sort of accomplish a separation of, of uh, the powers that, pu that publishers have um, such that um, incident to them owning printing presses, they don't necessarily get to decide what we all read. So I think that's where I'm going to leave it and take questions. Yeah, sure. How did you decide that you wanted the Kindle to be your platform rather than the Nook uh, or one of the other things that's, that's available? Right. It's, well, so it's not, it's not just one decision, but it's, the, it's my initial decision. Um, and uh, principally because, so, so the way the free promotions work is you can, you're eligible to, to, to participate in the free promotions if you sign on to the Kindle Select program. Um, to do that, you have to commit to exclusivity with Kindle for 90 days. Um, and so I wanted to see what, um, what the free promos could do for me. Um, also, um, uh, participating in the Kindle Select um, program allows your works to be made available on loan to people who are sort of Kindle Prime members or Amazon Prime members who can then um, borrow for free um, works that are um, that are in the program, um, and the way um, and royalties can be paid. There, there's a Amazon sets aside um, a royalty pool each month. I think it's six hundred thousand the last couple of months that they will divvy up on a prorated basis based on the number of borrows your book has um, uh, to Amazon Prime members. So I thought that's um, I thought I would go with Kindle for those those reasons. Um, I. That doesn't rule me out from, from signing up for print on demand, um, which is something I'm thinking about doing now. My mother says, I want, I'm not going to read a book that's on it. I'm not going to read a book on my phone. So, and then I deliberate about whether I want my mother to read my book. Um, <laughs> and so far, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing print on demand, so there you go. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know too much about um, how, how Fiction would be promoted on the web or elsewhere because I don't read very much fiction. I'm still trying to get through Finnegan's Wake, so I don't read too much modern stuff. But um, I know in the like the spiritual um, self-help area, which I guess you could call a subset of nonfiction. I'm not sure about that. Um, there are a lot of people prom promoting their books via their blogs, and I'm not sure how they get the um, how they get the Google rating so that you that you click on their blogs originally, but they do uh, refer one another um, mutually so that once you're on one, you, you hear about others. And they're constantly giving you glimpses into the wisdom of their books and giving you opportunities to purchase their books. And there's a huge number of people doing that. So I don't know if something like that could be worked out that would, be, uh, that would work for people who are writing fiction. So I'll, I'll, I should tell you also about my experiences as a blogger. Um, which, uh, you know, I've, I've done a couple of blogs, some fictional, some blogging the novel, some entirely sort of, you know, real-time fiction, you know, journal entry kind of stuff, uh, and some just sort of general interest blogging. Um, and with Google Analytics, I was able to track sort of in real time um, who was reading my blog because it would say, one person in Texas read your blog, and I said, I know that guy. That's my friend from high school. Um, <laughs> so, so, and the numbers tended not to go up, um, notwithstanding, and, and occasionally you would. Occasionally you might get, uh, you might write something that, that for whatever reason trips a Google trigger and is the, the work that comes up when you search for certain terms. Um, and then you'd find that you had a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, visitors for that particular entry. Um, so it's a, there's a little bit of a, um, uh, there's a little bit of chicken and egg problem in the sense that um, you got to get your, got to get people reading your blog too, um, but that's one thing that I, I have 
I could probably commit a little more to. What I was trying to sort of do with the Turnpike Witch page is I, is I you know, I put blurbs up. I would put um, little commentaries that ostensibly came from this character who's the witch. Um, and, and just they, they may or may not make it into someone's Facebook feed. I don't know that anyone understands sort of the arcane theories by which um, the, the things that people write on Facebook make their way into feeds. Um, but uh, that's, one, that's one sort of plan that I've had um, and, and have maybe failed in the, in, in the commitment and the execution to. But the idea would be that, that to kind of keep her, this character, communicating with people in a way that might be, may, make people think they'd want to buy a book and read about her. So. Hi, Brad. Hi. Um, <laughs> it's so great to hear. I really appreciate the intersection here between the sort of emotional experience of what it feels like to be in this system and also the sort of analysis of how it, it works on a tech, you know, algorithmic level. Um, I appreciate that. I have a couple comments. Um, one is to say that what you're saying about the publishing Industry is basically the same in music. Basically, the problems that you're laying out are the same in music, which is, for um, those who I don't know in the room, is what I do. Um, and I think um, a, a couple a couple things. One, um, there's a, and it's also, there's a movement in comedy right now that's sort of analogous to what you're talking about as well. Um, you have this, uh, Louis C.K. came up with his own ticketing system and a direct-to-fan approach. But um, just a couple of days ago, the comedian Patton Oswalt wrote this, um, he was speaking at a, a conference and his keynote was a letter to gatekeepers. And um, what he was trying to do was kind of address these, these folks. Um, it's, not, I don't, it's not my favorite thing, what, the way he wrote it, but his idea is saying to the gatekeepers, like, by the way, if you continue to think narrowly, you're going to kill your industry. And it was really nice to see, sort of, we can work outside this gatekeeper industry, we can also, like, maybe talk to the gatekeepers and try to come up with something there. So I wanted to offer that comment. And um, in case people don't know, on Facebook now, you can pay to have more people see your post. Um, it's called Promoted Posts. It's worth checking out. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say is um, I, I think that there's this basic problem. I don't Maybe I'm not going to call it a problem or an advantage, but it's a basic piece of human nature that people just want to participate in things that other people are participating in. And, and I think that... Um, I think that can work for us and against us in terms of trying to find something in this attention economy, right, that we start talking about. And, um, and I, I guess the, the last thing I'll say in terms of like strategy or something that I've seen work is this idea that sort of a combination of all three of your phases, right, of your patron phase and your um, sort of gatekeeper industry phase and then this sort of outside of it are these fan funding things that people are doing, Kickstarters, where you get somebody in at the patron, literally the patron level, and get them excited about the production of your work. Um, and then they become evangelicals, basically, for you as your work comes out. Um, and uh, I guess that's what I want to add. But thank you so much um, for adding all this person, especially, if he's, especially the emotional piece of it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely, a, there's definitely, what I had to account for was sort of the gap between sort of, this is how I see, this is how I see the trajectory of literary production, and I think it's all to the better, and we need to get there, and it's going to be fantastic for writers when we get there, um, but at the same time sort of holding on to the hope that someone was going to dangle a, a publishing contract for me um, so that I could step out of that. Um, so I, I, it's definitely, it's, and, and what, what's nice about giving this talk is it gave me sort of the opportunity to work through you know, why that gap is there. Um, and, and, and I was thinking about it yesterday, that they're, they, they're very good at giving you hope that, um, and I don't think it's because necessarily they say, we need to perpetuate our paradigm or we are dominant. We need to give this author hope so that he doesn't go out and self-publish. They're not thinking that way. <laughs> they're being polite. Um, and so this is, this, is a, this is, you know, one of the rejection letters. Um, the ones that I got from editors, you know, and again, these were written not to me, but to um, my agent, um, with whom the, the editor really wanted to sustain a relationship. They were fantastic. I felt like I was so very close. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, by the way, that same agent um, gave up the business to go back to school to study anthropology because I think it was, <laughs> it had more, it had greater prospects for him than, than selling books by the likes of me. 
Um, and, the, and the editor took this extended leave of absence. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go back directly to the editor with the Turnpike Witch. And, um, <coughs> and the editor was gone. He's married to Molly Ringwald, which is an interesting sort of side note. Um, and then therefore decided he wasn't going to read <laughs> books anymore for a period of time. So, and, and you find that you have, okay, I just need to hang on to this one person. And that person evaporates. And where are you? So, yep. Am I, am I choosing? Oh. I hope you don't mind. I'd like to return to a kind of a professional question. Sure. With the digital revolution, um, my concerns are mostly about copyright issues. Mm -hmm. And can you address that in any way um, with the fact that digital is a lot easier to hack into than a printed book? So, you know, uh, disseminate without your knowledge and so forth and so on. And again, this is also a, a problem for musicians. Uh, we're, right. we're both authors and musicians, published. So self-publishing is something we're looking at because the, re the royalties you get from traditional publishing aren't terrific, but at least you're protected in a lot of ways that I don't know if you are in digital publishing. Could you address that, please? Sure, yeah, so, so um, I would take the trade in a minute. Um, uh, that I, I, part of the, so the, the side of the note that I didn't talk about, because this, um, this was for a law journal, um, was focusing on sort of the interplay between these sort of power dynamics and, and the development of copyright law. Um, and it's not a coincidence that, that the first copyrights were, were privileges that were given, exclusive privileges that were given to, to the publishers, stationers' privileges that were granted by the Crown. Because the Crown wanted to develop a, a printing industry, and it understood that there was no dearth of manuscripts out there for people to publish. The problem was making sure that we organized this in a way that people weren't undercutting each other by publishing the same works. Um, also, they could um, keep an eye on what printers were publishing, so there was a an aspect of censorship there. But I, I think even today, um, <coughs> you know, the copyright concerns are, um, uh, you hear them most, uh, they're most pronounced coming from, from publishers. Um, and, and I think... Um, I, I think people are very concerned about it too. Okay, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say categorically that they're not, but I know that a lot of, a lot of writers are, or a lot of, Writers, creative people are also content to, to circulate their works for free, to put them out there knowing that they could very well proliferate and it might not result in them making a living. But for someone like me who doesn't see himself making a living in the, in the first place, it's livable for me. So, yeah? Um, I don't want to speak for both David Weinberger and I, but both of us... Um, co-authored a book, The Clutre Manifesto, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. The entire thing is available free online and it still sells well. So it's just an interesting fact. I'm, I'm wondering, Brad, um, why not just, I mean, considering how little income you're getting out of it, why not just make it freely available by, with you know, an open format and, and just put out a tip jar and see what happens that right. way? And um, and it, it, related to that, though, is, is, is how comfortable you feel inside the silo that is Amazon. Because right. it's becoming, Amazon is now a monopoly, basically. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what I'm trying to understand a little better is, is how useful it is to have somewhere like Amazon that, that you know people are going to to buy books um, and therefore looking within Amazon that they're going to be in a position to find you. And when they find you, they're, they're the sort of person that's going to want to be buying a book. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I could set, you know, I, I have in the past set up, um, here it is, download, download it, um, read it, um, read it with all the interactive features. Um, and I, I didn't get, um, I certainly was in a position where I was getting 350 free downloads. So yeah, so it might be a deal with the devil in the sense that, you know, I, um, I'm, this, this is the exclusive place where I can run free, if I want to run free promos, I got to give them exclusivity. Um, and so, but I don't have to do it forever. So I'm to see if I can sort of build up some interest and start to climb the curve, maybe get some positive reviews and then, and then move out, make it available in a, in a lot of formats. Um, obviously it's not, 
it's not possible on Amazon to just simply offer it for 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 zero dollars. Um, I think three three dollars. I think it might be the lowest that I'm that I'm allowed to offer it at least at this royalty rate. So, um, <coughs> yeah, go for it. I have two questions. A question for the audience and a question for you. So I'm going to ask the audience first. I'm going to stand up to do it. Please raise your hand if you are going to leave here and buy Brad's book. Raise your hand if you're going to buy his book. Be honest. Yeah. If, you ha if you're not one of the four who bought it last month. What the hell? Why aren't, why am, why aren't your hands going up? Okay. Three bucks, it would kill you to spend three bucks to support a local author? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I don't mean to be abusive. So. <laughs> Uh, it was during the free promo. It was there. You so, go. <laughs> so getting I, so it for free in this case counts as, as buying it. So, <laughs> so I defeated myself in that case. <laughs> but I, I and I think you know I, I think it's I mean I think it, it's it's demonstrative and it's not to say that it's a bad state of things, but it's the state of things that that um, you know if you tell I don't know how many people are in this room sixty people that that fifty that there's a good this is a good book. Um, people still have to care enough to want to buy it and put in the time to read it. And if, if, if that, the fact that that number goes from 50 to 5 doesn't surprise me or trouble me, um, that's sort of what I've been learning as I've been going along. So if this. you don't mind, if there are other people, I'm actually sort of interested as a focus group. What, it's not, so it's not price. There is the hardware. There's Nook problem. You know, it's a serious issue. So uh, um, I, didn't, I have a queue, like a backlog, like you of books that right. I want to read. I, it's not that I'm necessarily going to go buy it, but I'm definitely going to look into it. And it's more or less driven by the fact that I'm here today hearing him speak, learning about who he is, and feeling like a connection with it. Otherwise, I have no connection. Right. Which that, is not the way it used to work, right? It used to get the review. So this actually goes against your, oh, it's not against exactly, but against sure. your hope that a reader-driven ecosystem of reviews is what's going to move when, in fact, at least in some instances, it's connection with the author, which is something right. that Kickstarter provides uh, to some degree that may move first. You could certainly right. have both. But. And, and one thing that, I, that I've seen actually, and, and you did this when I, when you, after you did the review, and, and I've seen when I've contacted book bloggers and said, you know, would you be interested in, in doing a review? They said, well, that, yes. And, and in fact, like if, if once we do the review, we'll be in touch with you to do a QA and a um, so that we can learn more about you and communicate more about you to... To read. Of course, I'd, I'd jump on that because that does, you know, it, it creates the possibility for that connection to happen. It can, it can also turn people off terribly. I have, um, at least on one occasion, on the Facebook site, um, a woman came on and said something along the lines of, hey, I'm a witch. And I said, <laughs> oh, geez. I, and I kind of said, okay. Um, and I, and I, I, and then my, this good friend of mine who's the webmaster at Rice and is the social media guru, he's like, you need to engage that person. So, I, okay, so, so I, I tried, I did. I, I did what I thought I could do. Um, and then that person unliked me <laughs> and deleted the post within, within minutes. And thought, so I thought, okay, so, so not all interactions with people are going to be connecting. Some of them are going to be alienating. And that's, that's, that, that, that's how it is when you, when you talk to people. I think people are going to like you or they aren't. But... There's, there's risks in that, I suppose. So, um, is, I is this on why you're not buying the book? I raised my hand. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why the hell would you buy this book? He <laughs> recommended it to me. Take it as flattery. And, and, and I'm sorry, you, you have some association with Amazon, I understand. Oh, a former, yes. Yeah. I, I, I very recently came from Amazon, so I'm happy to engage anyone on a discussion about it. Amazon as a company, but that's not what I'm talking about. I will reserve my other question for later. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, I'm looking at the Facebook page, and the Facebook page is um, the cover of the book. It's not you. I'm curious, 
you know, I feel in the online space, creators can very easily deploy, but not connect. And I think that's part of the issue. Um, I'm curious how much, you know, do, are people going out there and doing live readings or going to open mic nights um, and reading a chapter or garnering, you know, a little bit more tangible, personal connection with people that would engage them. I mean, I, I know for me, I go into media overload. I don't know what to look at anymore, so I just stop and I quit, frankly. And this is from somebody who worked at one of the largest e-commerce companies of the, wor of the world, and I was just like, I, I, I don't even know where to sift, where to look, which is where the curatorial factor of the publisher comes into play. I. I love the idea of circumventing the curatorial function of the publisher because I think they have become stud. They, they look for a formula in many cases and they're looking at bottom lines that the self-published author doesn't have to adhere to. But I don't think just putting something online personally resonates widely because how do you find the needle in the haystack? Who do you look at? And I'm just curious if if there's some interrelationship, like right now, I just met you, I heard you speak, I'm interested in your book, I met others who read it, suddenly I wanna, I'm gonna go on Amazon, whether I get it for free or pay the three bucks. Oh, you gotta pay now. You gotta awesome. Pay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to support the book, and then if I like it, I'm happy to go on my Facebook page and say, read this book. Um, you know, to all of my friends and hopefully right. proliferate it. So I'm just curious where that interplay is. Um, so uh, one of the, th I edit a, a online literary magazine and uh, one of the things that's really been great for us has been just that, like um, finding folks who are already reading at open mics, f like really already making a connection. And then we don't have to, those of us who are part of this magazine are also writers ourselves. So what we're able to do is still have gatekeepers of a sort, but not, uh, but the gatekeepers are made up of people within the community of writers and readers that, that's already present. You don't have to spontaneously generate it as an individual. Um, and one of the other things that, uh, that uh, around New England is there's a bunch of these kind of independent publishers who are not um, primarily motivated by profit. Um, and so, you know, getting a novel excerpt in a journal like like mine or like many others that's, that's an independent journal and has a community readership that like all of the readers that read, you know, these four poetry journals go to the New England Poetry Festival. And so poets know, go to the New England Poetry, you know, go to or the Massachusetts Poetry Festival every year and read in front of those people who include both the readers of those journals and the publishers of those journals. And, and finally, I wanna mention another project uh, called Best Indie Lit New England. Um, I've gotten together a group of about 15 editors of publications of this kind um, and it ran a successful Kickstarter campaign, that can work. Um, and again, we had an existing community. Um, and then from there, um, you know, kind of publishing an anthology series. So I'm just saying there's independent, I just wanna say there's, it's not, there's, there's something in between self-publishing as a, as a kind of lone individual and um, commercial uh, publishing success. There are communities of independent publishers that are, that are worth engaging with. Well, and I, The, the, where we raised the funds for the initial printing of Best Indie Lit New England was uh, on Kickstarter. Kickstarter? Oh, Best Indie Lit New England, byline.org. So, so I, I probably did, um, certainly did, speak too narrowly when I talked about sort of authors in isolation, hoping that readers in isolation will, will, will sprout up and communicate something to other readers in isolation. And I think... Um, uh, there is a uh, what I what I would hope for, and what I what I probably didn't explain as well is exactly what you're describing, which is sort of um, making this something that's more of a than than something that where the content is broadcast to you, and you can choose whether or not to receive it and and react to it. Um, Have you tried to do some, some reading? 
Have you tried to do some readings, like in open mics, venues, but, or, or, or do you need also to be a published author to, <laughs> to be invited at well, bookstores? To, so, to so, right, so I gotta follow my sword at a certain point um, and answer for my own negligence. Um, one of the reasons why I write um, is because um, I do it better than I speak. Um, in fact, I, I worked for a judge out of law school and I was explaining something to her once and she said, you need to find a job where you write things to people instead of talking to them. <laughs> and, I, and I thought of the two ways that you could take that and I, I elected to take it as a compliment. Um, but but given, that, given that fact, one of the reasons I, I write is because it's something I can do and it's just me. And I, and I, and I, still, I think I still probably see myself as someone who who is going to put this out and, and, and broadcast it and then step away and, and you know, pull this thing down and hide behind it and see what people say. Um, and what I'm finding is that that's not, that's not getting me where I need to be. So I need to be um, if I want to commit to, to this. Um, and one of my motivations in publishing this was, well, okay, just get rid of it. Then work on something else that I can submit to a traditional publisher and I can brace myself and I can hope. Um, uh, and, but now I'm thinking, well, why don't I try a little harder? Why don't I do things a little more deftly with social media? And it's a question of time and commitment. It's something that I, and, and, and something that I need to, to, to probably do a, a, a lot better um, than I have. I, I think there's a, uh, my talent lies in composition and not so much in salesmanship. Um, but that's something, and so what I've tried to do is actually generate media that that does the promotional work in a way that is interesting and, and I think valuable to me. And so, that, so what I've been doing is I've been supporting the content that I'm just throwing out there with more content that I'm just throwing out there. Um, so something's probably got to change. Long-winded answer. Yeah, I don't know. I won't make the choice. <laughs> Hi. Um, let's see. I guess the first thing I want to say is that I think your expectations of traditional publishers may be um, overly optimistic because I have a friend who wrote a book, had it published by a traditional publisher. Um, now he's, I believe, li living in Washington State, hadn't seen him in like 15 or 20 years and suddenly he was in Boston. Why? He was taking his vacation and essentially doing, uh, you know, doing book promotions at bookstores around the country, all of which he arranged on his own. The publisher did nothing for him other than, you know, put it into hard copy. So the, the other comment, though, has to do with, although the first and second phase that you're talking about are certainly not, not good. You know, I'm not arguing that um, traditional publishing is a good thing, but I do think where uh, digital has taken us at this point is equally bad, if not worse. Um, I don't know, there, there's a fellow I had never heard of before about a month ago, I think I read about this uh, on Andy Oram's blog and then got pointed to an article by a guy named Charlie Strauss, who I came to learn from his website. He's a science fiction author right now, publishes exclusively digitally, in a former life, he was a software engineer and also spent some time working for a publishing house. And he has an excellent analysis of what exactly Amazon's doing to the market. He describes it as monopsony, which is sort of similar to monopoly, except that there's a single buyer rather than a single seller. And they're essentially, uh, you know, they've essentially taken control of all the publishers in the world. Um, by having this, you know, you know, having a single outlet and having a proprietary format. And I think locking everything into a proprietary format, as a software engineer myself, um, I'm very sensitive to some of the issues. And I've seen companies usually with regard to publishing software, but nowadays with regard to publishing literature, uh, do what I describe as seizing custody of a work. And they, in the past, they've done this via, uh, you know, either data format custody or nowadays with the cloud, they're doing it by um, physical custody, where the thing only lives on their servers 
And in Amazon's case, they have the ability to, and in the past have, reached out to uh, people's Kindles and removed things that have been there in the past. So that, that's pretty much it. I, just, I don't think where we're at is necessarily better than where we were before. So a couple of reactions. I, I don't mean to be sort of unequivocally um, uh, critical of, of, of traditional publishers. It has been, it has worked wonders for us in many ways. Um, and uh, people can make livings as writers. Maybe not as many, maybe it's not me, bummer for me. But, um, and, and we do have certainly a much greater um, corpus of works available to us than we would if they, if they weren't out there. Um, and they do, um, they do the important work of, of helping us decide. The question is whether you trust them, whether you think that you're missing something. Um, so all those things I think are, are, are beneficial. I obviously have a different angle on it because I have sort of cast myself against that wall and been repulsed a number of times. Um, the, um, the Amazon question, you know, it's, it's, it's one of trade-offs that I, I think I can sort of try to continue to make in real time um, as I decide sort of what are they offering me that I can't get elsewhere. Um, uh, but over time, yes, it's the place you go. I mean, I, I'm aware of Smashwords. I know people who publish on Smashwords. Um, but it's not necessarily where I, where I go. It's not going to be at the top of the, of the search results. Um, <coughs> the, uh, you know, one interesting thing that, I, that, that people are complaining about Amazon is that there's too much there. There's just too much junk there. Um, one of the, the, the Berkman Fellows hours, people, someone observed that they, um, or complained that they had gone onto Amazon to buy what they thought was an interesting monograph about a particular subject matter, only to find that it was a verbatim rendition of the Wikipedia article, um, which was totally fine with copyright for people to carry over and sell on, on Amazon. Um, I was you know, researching for this talk and looking through, uh, just reading some more about Amazon publishing, and you know, people were saying, there needs to be some kind of spam indication, that people can mark something as spam because there's just too much spam here. Um, or Amazon needs to do something because this is out of control. Of course, one person's spam is another one's carnitas. And I, I would go out tomorrow and I'd spam the daylights out of Fifty Shades of Grey. Why not? Um, so um, rather than have an on-off an on binary like spam, why not have people contribute their thoughts about well, why they like this, why they didn't? Um, one of the things that, you know, as someone who tends to, toward the long-winded and prefers writing 500-page novels to 140-character tweets, um, I... I I don't necessarily see social media as a place where we can have sort of nuanced, real sort of critical conversations about, um, about literature. Um, it's, and, and I don't know that that's happening either necessarily in the, in the review section of, of Amazon. Hi, Brad, thank you. Sure. Um, I was interested in coming to the event today because uh, I, am in the process of writing a book with a publisher that'll be published next year, and it's my first book, and I was really curious just about using, you know, what means are available to create um, audience, because even with big house publishers, it's really up to the authors now. The publishing house does very little compared to what they used to do. What's been sort of interesting, um, the book I'm writing, it's a nonfiction book, sort of memoir and biography, but it's about my father, who in San Francisco in the 1970s was very much on the outside, sort of, uh, queer writer and single father, but poet and self-published, you know, eight books and eventually became an editor at Poetry Flash. But when I look back at what he went through in that process before the digital age, it was all, you know, shoe leather uh, materials, you know, pr printing like thousands of um, broadsides himself, going bookstore to bookstore and organizing these readings and, um, and finding audience. And, and it, it amazes me to see even the extent of what he did, because at the time there was no money. He wasn't even considering doing it for money. It was just about finding community, promoting other writers like himself, and kind of, and the satisfaction of sort of sharing those ideas. And now, you know, I, who hasn't put in nearly the number of years that he did at the time with this book, I'm getting him more eyeballs or, you know, readership than he would have ever been right. able to have in his time. Um, and Anyway, I mean, I bring this up because I, 
it's 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 just like now today it, there are all these means obviously and it's much easier to reach people but i feel like for him and what was successful or what was satisfying was like finding that niche of like who are the people who would be most interested and and like befriending them and really like very community oriented way of sort of approaching similar writers and and getting together and and doing those readings and 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 even you know thinking that maybe 20 years after the fact you might find <laughs> that audience um anyway i just right. Was appreciating that. I mean, I think that goes a little bit to the conversation we were starting to have about copyright, which is that uh, f copyright is an incentive for people to to do something creative, um, but I don't think it's anything close to um, uh, the whole ball of wax. I think, I mean, uh, because when you consider the number of people that do create things and how hard they work at them. Um, and the extent to which any of them are able really to capitalize on the copyright that they acquire and then by creating them. Um, you realize that, that really what we're doing, what we're trying to do, isn't to create a product so much that we can sell as to communicate something. Um, I've been largely content over the years, and one reason why I it went on for so long, is I, I was communicating to the future iterations of self. I would go back and I'd read this again. And I thought, oh, that, that kind of liked that. That was, I enjoyed reading that part of the book that I wrote. <laughs> I was the reader. I was communicating to myself, um, uh, for lack of any other real options. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think the reason why we do what we do, um, or a, a, at least the reason why I do what I do, is that I want to communicate something in the end. Um, <clears throat> and... You know, there's the questions of sort of commitment and energy and distractions and having another career and all those other things that, that maybe result in me not being as effective in, in, in the actual delivery of the communication as I'd like to be. Um, but I feel like that's, that's why we do it. And I'm, and I'm starting to feel that more and more as I put it up here and I, I've made $70 in three months, so. <laughs> Hi, Brad. Uh, my name is Fernando uh, Albertorio. Um, I came here to see you. Um, I'm a co-founder of a new startup company based in Boston. And actually, we're trying to solve this exact problem by helping uh, authors connect with their readers, empowering the readers uh, as reviewers, as gatekeepers, uh, while we provide technology that enables to lend credibility to reviews, uh, <laughs> to content and how that reviewer and that content influences within a community or within the more global scope of the internet. Uh, it's clear that the problems that has been talked about in the room, uh, first of all, the publishing industry is going through a massive transformation. Uh, Self-publishing is growing at an enormous rate, 400% uh, since uh, uh, 2010. And right now it's reaching a $14 billion market. Uh, publishers are losing money. Uh, it doesn't mean that because an author reached a publishing deal that they are going to be guaranteed a budget uh, in, uh, for the promotion uh, and to tap into the promotion machine. Uh, so it's very clear uh, that in 2001, you've described exactly the problem that a lot of the independent authors um, are facing, which is the ability to be discovered and for their content or their book uh, to be passed along by readers themselves. Because, I mean, I'm pretty sure that when people leave here, uh, they're going to find your book. I'm reading your book right now, and I'm actually really enjoying it. But you're going to find that people here will then suggest it to a friend and pass it forward. And we're trying to take that and multiply it by thousands, or if not, even bigger. Uh, so I'd definitely like to connect with you later on. Great. Thank you. Sounds good to me. One more short question, and then I have an offer. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name's Elizabeth, and um, I'm intrigued, actually, by these two sides of your personality, you know, the button-down guy who counts the data, and then the creative <laughs> guy who doesn't believe he can speak very well. And I'm just wondering, you know, if this is a very readable book, is there any possibility you could get someone with some celebrity to actually do the reading, 
maybe on YouTube or whatever to make use of the media so that you could really get it out there and get some followers for somebody who's already got a whole bunch of followers. Aaron, you're the celebrity that I know. <laughs> could you perform this? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm increasingly feeling as though really, and uh, that a lot of this has to do with, I guess the term I use is authority. And, and finding ways that people who have authority, um, have, have sort of a broader authority in the community, can, can take hold of something and recommend it. Um, I got a fantastic unsolicited review from a guy. Um, I think it's Bennett Gavrish. It's from around here. Um, it didn't result in sort of a, 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 a meaningful, I don't think, um, improvement in my in my numbers, but, but then again, if he acquires and accumulates some kind of authority, then, then you've got something. And, and as you were saying, sort of the celebrity is the person who has that sort of built-in authority. And I think it's really, it's, it's um, you see this on Twitter, where people are trying to get their, their, their comments or their links retweeted by Ashton Kutcher, because for whatever reason, everybody, including CNN.com, is obsessed with Ashton Kutcher's Twitter feed. Um, and, and, and that's sort of the, the fast track to try to get on, is to get the person who's got mega authority as opposed to um, a, a, a modest amount of, of authority, or as opposed to me, who is negligible online authority. Um, so, so, so that's definitely, that, that's sort of, I see that as sort of part of the, the picture, is that maybe it's sort of beyond just having people review and comment, having endorsement, having, um, <coughs> you know, having the this, this same friend of mine um, that was, was uh, um, consulting with me on how to handle my, my Facebook like um, <coughs> is a musician and he's we've talked about he said he's going to make a soundtrack he's going to bring his his followers um, on board by um, putting out uh, putting out a, an industrial rock soundtrack to the book um, and so we'll see what comes of that that's maybe the closest I've got to, <laughs> to celebrity access. <coughs> Um, I wish that Amazon would let, especially for a $3 book, for, um, I wish that they would let enthusiastic readers be crowd patrons, because I certainly would put up 10 bucks, so that, or 9 bucks, right. so another three people could, could read it. That's an offer I want to make to you. If there are three people who otherwise would not have bought the book, it's the $3 that's holding you back. I'm good for it. Seriously. <laughs> see me afterwards. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brad. Thanks, David.